Things sure are getting interesting at Lakedon Elementary School. Can't wait to see what happens next. This is our seventh installment of No Talking by Andrew Clements. Chapter 17, Alliances. As he walked toward his first period class, Dave felt relieved. He was glad Mrs. Hyde had put an end to the contest. He was especially glad he wouldn't have to actually mark a big L on Lindsay's forehead, or the reverse of that. Now he could just think about his schoolwork again, because he really was a pretty good student, and that's why he was in the high math group. But as he went into the math room, he didn't talk to his friends, and they didn't talk to him, and none of the girls were talking either. No one was actually sure that the contest was over, and no one was taking chances, including Dave. The bell rang, and as everyone took their seats, it was still completely quiet. Mrs. Escobar got right down to business. All right, students. We're still working on metric conversions, and let's see. Who's got an answer for the first homework problem? Lindsay raised her hand, and when Mrs. Escobar nodded, she said, 312. Mrs. Escobar frowned. 312 what? Lindsay said, degrees Celsius. Mrs. Escobar looked at Lindsay. You heard what the principal said a few minutes ago. Lindsay nodded. About how this little game needs to stop? Lindsay nodded again and then raised her hand. Mrs. Escobar nodded and Lindsay said, but why? Why? said the teacher. Because it's not good for anyone. It slows down our classwork. Like right now, we should be doing math, and instead we're talking about not talking. Lindsay said, math is numbers. Yes, said Mrs. Escobar, but we need to use words to talk about how we're using numbers. You know that. You all know that. So stop this right now. Lindsay stood up and pointed at the dry erase board. May I? Mrs. Escobar said, go ahead. Lindsay had her homework paper in one hand and a marker in the other. She wrote out the numbers for the first problem and then showed the three steps she used to get the correct answer. She turned to Mrs. Escobar, and when the teacher nodded, she said, How's that? Mrs. Escobar started to boil over. I am not amused by this, Lindsay. I know what you're doing, and I will not stand for it. Now stop it. Lindsay stood at the board. She pointed at the problem. Is it right? Another three words. Dave knew that look on the teacher's face. It meant trouble, serious trouble. And not just for Lindsay. He held his breath, waiting for the explosion. But the very next moment, Dave amazed himself. He raised his hand. Mrs. Escobar had to grit her teeth, but she managed to say, yes. Dave pointed at the solution on the board and said, mine is different. Without asking permission, Dave was on his feet. He grabbed the marker from Lindsay and scrawled his answer onto the board. He had the same answer, but he had worked with fractions instead of decimals. Mrs. Escobar said, how many of you did it the way Dave did? About half the hands went up. And the way Lindsay solved it, the other half went up. The teacher nodded. That's good. Does everyone see why it can be done both ways? Everyone nodded. Okay. Here's a tougher question. Kelly. Which way is easier, Dave's way or Lindsay's way? Kelly said, Lindsay's. Really, asked the teacher, how come? Fewer steps. And all around the room, Mrs. Escobar saw heads nodding, saw, that, saw the special light that shows up on a kid's face when understanding happens. She smiled, that's right. Decimals really do make things easier. Tyler raised his hand and said, with a calculator, which got a laugh from the whole class. And as they laughed, Dave and Lindsay looked at each other for about half a second. Not quite a friendly look, but similar. Then Dave thought, this means the contest is still on. And he wasn't sure how he felt about that. The class sailed through the rest of the conversion problems. Miles to kilometers, kilograms to ounces, acres to hectares, on and on. And every student responded using three words or less, or with written answers on the board. Mrs. Escobar knew the kids weren't obeying Mrs. Hyatt, 
She knew they were still counting words, still keeping silent unless called on. But honestly, at this moment, she didn't care. She was in the middle of an amazingly productive class period, and everyone was so focused, so alert, so engaged. Compared to the classroom experience she'd had with these same kids just 24 hours ago, well, it was like night and day. And she liked the day much better. And what was happening in the other first period classrooms on Wednesday? Classrooms where Lindsay and Dave were not on hand to provide some leadership? As science class began, Mrs. Marlowe had already decided to make an example of the first kid who gave her a three-word answer. And it happened to be Kyle. I asked you to tell me about the order Lepidoptera, the teacher said. Kyle nodded. Butterflies and moths, he repeated. And that's all you know, she said. He nodded again. Pretty much, which got a giggle from the class. Mrs. Marlowe grabbed a notepad and picked up a pencil, reading out loud as she wrote, Dear Mrs. Hyatt, Kyle has refused to obey your instructions. He is not participating in class discussion, and he... Kyle raised his hand, and Mrs. Marlowe snapped. What? I'm participating. No, she said. You are deliberately using as few words as possible, and you are disobeying the principle. Cal shook his head. I'm conserving. She said, that's nonsense. Conservation means, Kyle finished her sentence, not wasting. Mrs. Marlowe glared at him. Conservation is for energy and water and soil and forest. Words don't need conserving. Maybe they do, Kyle said, which was an which was awfully brave of him. And all the kids in class nodded their agreement with Kyle, which was also very brave. Mrs. Marlowe felt herself getting angry. However, she was an extremely logical person, and she had to admit that Kyle had a point. Anyone who had ever eaten lunch in the teacher's room or sat through a whole faculty meeting would have to agree that a lot of words get wasted every school day. And all that endless gabbing that had made the unshushable so famous, 99% waste. But she said, regardless of that, the principal said you must all participate normally in class. Kyle scrunched up his face. What's normal? Mrs. Marlowe said, in this case, it means talking the way the principal wants you to. The way I want you to. The way everyone usually talks and answers, normally. Kyle said, can normal change? Well, and Mrs. Marlowe paused. She paused because just three days ago, they had discussed climate change, and she had explained how a normal temperature now would have been considered abnormal a hundred years ago. And she knew Kyle would remember that. The whole class probably remembered. This was a very bright group. She continued, yes, you could say that, but it's certainly not normal to use only three words at a time, or no words at all, not at school. Kyle shrugged. Works for me. Mrs. Marlowe thought back to all the times in the past week when she'd had to yell at Kyle about his nonstop whispering, about his constant joke telling, about his never-ending comments on anything and everything that ran through his twitchy little head. And she looked at Kyle sitting there quietly, giving her his full attention, and every other student was doing the same. And suddenly, the idea of trying to make these kids talk, actually demanding they all go back to being noisy, self-absorbed chatterbrains, it simply wasn't logical. So Mrs. Marlowe decided to go ahead with her lesson for the day, and she adjusted herself to the new normal, because the new normal was at least 10 times better than the old normal. In social studies, there were more oral reports, and Mrs. Overby called on Ed Canner and Bill Harkness to go first. The boys walked to the front of the room, stood shoulder to shoulder, and both of them looked down at the index cards in Bill's hands. Ed said, Italy is old. Then Bill said, The Roman Empire, and Ed said, ruled the world. And Bill said, for many centuries. And Mrs. Overby said, what do you two boys think you're doing? Ed said, giving our report. And Bill said, on Italy. 
No, said the teacher. You're still playing that game, counting the words. But we practiced, Ed said. We're ready, Bill said. And Ed said, can we finish? Like the other teachers, up and down the fifth grade hall, Mrs. Overby had to make a decision. Go with the flow, which promised to be very quiet and orderly, or call for the principal, raise a ruckus, and try and force these kids to be their regular old noisy selves again. As a student of history, Mrs. Overby knew about the power of grassroots movement. She also knew about the power of civil disobedience. But mostly, she decided that this no-talking craze was actually a pretty good social experiment. Plus, she didn't feel like the kids thought they were winning and she was losing. It, it wasn't like that. They were just having a different kind of communication experience together. That's all. True, Ed and Bill's report on Italy was choppy and awkward and a little hard to follow as they passed the narration back and forth like a ping pong ball. But the boys made all their points. Learning took place and the whole class sat silently and paid close attention. And the next five reports went almost as smoothly. What more could a social studies teacher ask for? So, like the other teachers, Mrs. Overby chose the quiet way. And she decided she'd talk to the other teachers later in the morning and see how they were handling this thing. And she'd talk to Mrs. Hyatt, too. Language arts was the easiest class for the kids. Mr. Burton didn't even try to make them stop their activity. If they wanted to be quiet and talk only in three-word bursts, he was all for it, no matter what the mighty Miss Hyatt, Mrs. Hyatt had said. After all, this was his classroom, wasn't it? And if he believed this way of using words could provide a good language arts learning experience, then couldn't he proceed with it? Yes, absolutely. But he wasn't foolish. He walked to the back of the room stuck his head out into the hallway, looked both ways, and then closed his door. Back at the front of the room, Mr. Burton said, Eric and Rachel, please come up and sit in these chairs. When they were seated, he said, you two are going to have a short debate. A debate is an orderly argument, and each of you will take opposing sides on the same issue. The question is, should there be soft drink machines in school cafeterias? Rachel, you will argue for this question, and Eric, you will argue against it. You will take turns speaking, and you may use no more than three words for each statement. Ready? Eric and Rachel shook their heads no. Mr. Burton said, don't worry. You'll both do fine. Eric, you first, and you may begin. Eric said, soft drinks, bad. Rachel shook her head and said, not bad. Delicious. Eric frowned. Too much sugar. Rachel said, I like sugar. Eric shook his head. Sugar rots teeth. Rachel smiled a big smile. Not mine. Eric said, milk is better. Rachel shrugged. Try sugar free. Eric said, still bad nutrition. Rachel held up her arm and made a muscle. I eat vegetables. <coughs> Eric said, not everyone does. Rachel said, I like choosing. Eric said, soda is expensive. Rachel pulled a dollar from her pocket. I have enough. Eric said, spend it smarter. Rachel said, what about freedom? Eric shook his head, not at school. Rachel smirked, very bad news. And they went on like that for about five minutes with no let up. All the kids were fascinated. And of course, so was Mr. Burton. He took furious notes, writing down each response, trying to record the kind of gestures the kids made, their facial expressions, their tones of voice. Very few words were being exchanged, but whole worlds of ideas were floating around as the kids tried to build their arguments. They got emotional, and through the three-word limit was clearly a problem. Still, they packed a lot into so few words. It was like debating with condensed haiku. It was also sort of like listening to cave people talk, or maybe Tarzan. Hungry, eat now. And Mr. Burton wrote some three-word chunks of his own, which he intended to use in his human development paper. Every word counts. Choose power words. Hemingway would approve. Focus and narrow. 
Ideas are collapsible. Remember Miles Davis. And he looked at what he wrote. As he, as he looked at what he wrote, he thought, maybe I should write my whole paper using three-word sentences. That would certainly get the attention of my professor. In music class, the kids entered the room and sat silently, just like yesterday afternoon. Mrs. Akers was sure the students were going to disobey Mrs. Hyatt's orders, and she was ready to take some drastic steps to stop this nonsense. But when she played an introduction and launched into Over the River and Through the Woods, everyone sang right out. The teacher was amazed. Mrs. Akers felt like there had been a glorious victory for the forces of law and order, and she intended to write the principal a special note to say thanks for her strong leadership. In fact, though, the principal's talk was not the direct cause of singing. Taryn had written a simple note, and she'd shown it to all the boys and girls as they came into the music room. Singing is not talking. Deal? And by nodding, all the boys and all the girls had silently agreed that bending the contest rules a little was a good idea. Besides, no one wanted the Thanksgiving music program to sound lousy, and their contest would be over by then anyway. The boys and girls in that first period music class might not have noticed, but the important thing was not that they had agreed to sing. The important thing was that they had agreed about anything. Fifth grade boys and fifth grade girls at Lakedon Elementary School were actually cooperating and helping each other. And that's what was happening in the other fifth grade classrooms too. The boys and girls had joined forces without even realizing it. Together, they had resisted the pressure from the principal and from their teachers. They had used their wits and teamed up to prove that not talking was a simple, harmless activity. It wasn't like the boys and girls were getting all buddy-buddy or anything. It wasn't like the teasing or taunting had completely stopped, because old habits are hard to break. But still, cooties were dying all over the place. That was one result. Another result of the morning classes was that the kids had won a new kind of respect from their teachers. Teachers have great respect for order and self-discipline. Teachers love to make careful plans and then put them into action. It's what they do. And teachers hate noise and disorder and bouncing kids because these things keep them from accomplishing their careful plans. However, there was one gigantic problem with all this harmony and order and balance and peace that was blooming in the fifth grade hall. Mrs. Hyatt wasn't in the loop. She was clueless about these new developments. In fact, the principal wasn't even in the building during the morning. She was across town at the district offices working on next year's budget. She'd left her trusty teachers to carry out her strict orders. But Mrs. Hyatt had organized her meetings to be sure that she would be back at her school in time for fifth grade lunch, because the principal felt sure she would be needed at lunch with her bullhorn to keep law and order just like always, because Mrs. Hyatt had complete confidence in her teachers. She was sure that by lunchtime, everything would be back to normal. Chapter 18 Adventures in the Red Zone Mrs. Hyatt got back to her school at 11.59. There were several messages on her desk, and Mrs. Overby had taped a note to her chair that read, Please come see me in the teacher's room. But the principal was in a hurry. She needed to be on time for fifth grade lunch. Five minutes later, for the second day in a row, Mrs. Hyatt found herself standing in the middle of a silent cafeteria holding a big red plastic bullhorn. But today was different. She looked around the room, and the sight of all these fifth graders deliberately disobeying her, well, it nudged her over the edge. It pushed her right into the red zone. She gritted her teeth, and an angry haze filled her mind. She knew she was angry, and she knew it wasn't good to be angry, but she was. And she knew it wasn't good to be angry and try to talk to children at the same time, but she couldn't help herself. She had to talk to these kids right now. She could have whispered, and every fifth grader would have heard her, but she didn't whisper. She pulled the trigger on the bullhorn. Have you forgotten our assembly this morning? The principal's voice echoed off the walls. The kids stared at her. 
She aimed the bullhorn at Dave and yelled, David Packer, answer me. Do you remember what I told all of you this morning? When Dave nodded his head, she yelled, answer me with your voice out loud. So Dave swallowed his first bite of macaroni and cheese and said, I remember. His voice sounded very small. Dave felt like he was a scarecrow talking to the great and powerful Oz. Mrs. Hyatt took five steps closer to Dave and shouted, Then why aren't you talking with your friends? Dave had never seen Miss H Mrs. Hyatt this mad before, and no one had ever yelled at him with a bullhorn. It, it seemed unfair to be yelled at with that giant voice, so he decided he wasn't going to be afraid or angry, no matter what. Dave shrugged and said, Nothing to say, which was perfectly true. Before Mrs. Hyatt had started yelling, he'd been very happy to just sit and eat and think. Stand up! Dave stood up. Every kid in the room was watching him, and so was Mrs. Marlowe and the custodian and the cafeteria workers. Mrs. Hyatt said, talk. I want you to talk right now. I want to hear you tell Todd everything you learned in your classes this morning. Start talking to Todd now. Dave wasn't an angry sort of kid. Not usually. In fact, there was only one thing that nudged him over the edge, being bullied. The only time he'd ever gotten into a fight at school was back in the second grade when a fifth grader had started picking on him. That's when Dave had learned that you can't just go along with a bully because then you get bullied more and more. And that's how Dave felt right now. He was getting mad. It felt like Mrs. Hyatt was being a bully, a bully with a bullhorn. Again, the principal yelled, talk, and that did it. It was Dave's turn for a trip to the red zone. He glared at Mrs. Hyatt and he shouted, I do not have to talk right now if I don't want to. This is our lunchtime. None of us have to talk. And a sentence flashed into Dave's mind, something he'd heard dozens of times on TV shows. This sentence was usually being said to criminals wearing handcuffs, but that didn't seem to matter at the moment. Dave looked around the cafeteria at his classmates and he shouted, You have the right to remain silent. With that, Dave pressed his lips together, folded his arms across his chest, and sat down. Lindsay was the first to pick up on Dave's body language. She looked at Mrs. Hyatt and slowly folded her arms. All the girls at her lunch table did the same. And the gesture spread through the room like ripples in a pond. Every kid stared at the principal, arms folded, and stone silent. Mrs. Hyatt looked around slowly, drew herself up to her full height, and then walked briskly out of the room. She walked down the hall to the school office. She nodded at Mrs. Chaplin, the school secretary, and said, Hold my calls. Then she went into her own office and closed the door. Back in the cafeteria, it was dead calm. Every kid sat motionless, arms still folded, not sure what to do next. Todd started it. He unfolded his arms, nodded at Dave, and then clapped his hands. In three seconds, every fifth grade boy was clapping like mad. Dave nodded. Dave looked around at his friends and smiled and nodded. And a second later, guess who joined in? That's right, all the girls. And five seconds later, the hooting and whooping began. It was loud in that cafeteria. It was incredibly loud. The clapping and cheering was so loud that the sound went right through the cafeteria doors and walls and thundered down the hall all the way to the school office and right through the closed door of Mrs. Abigail Hyatt, principal. Phone on Mrs. Chaplin's desk buzzed. An intercom call. Yes, she said. The secretary listened, nodded, and said, right away. She got up and walked out of the office and down the hall into the cafeteria where it had gotten quiet again. Mrs. Marlowe was standing near the door, and Mrs. Chaplin whispered something to her. Mrs. Marlowe nodded and quickly walked halfway across the room. She bent down close to Dave Packer's ear and said, to the office. Dave swallowed his third bite of macaroni and cheese and looked up into the science teacher's face. I have to? She nodded. Principal's orders. Dave looked around the table at his friends. No one needed to speak a word. Their faces said it all. And the message 
three simple words, and Dave believed them. You are dead. <laughs>